Good morning, Steve. How are you? Morning. Good morning, Dr. Price. How are you? Good morning, Dr. Horfar. Good morning. Good morning. Amazing. We're all here. Happy Monday. <laughs> Same to you. Happy Monday. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Riley Stiff, and I'm the district manager for the Beverly Hills Territory for Doctors on Leans. And we would like to welcome you to Doctors on Leans' first webinar. And like everyone else, we are respecting the shelter in place order, and we figure this was the best way for you to meet our doctors as well as have a great discussion with our panelist, Steve Bartizarian. And we are open for business, uh, and we wanted to inform you on how we're handling cases at this time. So let's go ahead and introduce all of our panelists this morning. Dr. Price, is, I would love to start with you. He's a double board certified orthopedic surgeon and regenerative medicine from Pledge Medical with offices in Newport Beach, Bakersfield, Long Beach, and Riverside. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Horfar, he is a chiropractor with three offices one in Pasadena, one in South Central, and their newest location in Carson. Dr. Horfar, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Riley, for having us on. Absolutely, and last but certainly not least, we have our legal expert, Steve Vardazarian. For those of you who don't already know him, Steve is the 2019 Cala Trial Lawyer of the Year. Also last July, he obtained a $113 million verdict, which is the largest non-economic damage award for a single plaintiff ever. So we feel very, very lucky to have him. He's also the founding partner at Vardazarian Law Firm in Calabasas. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Great, great. So we, have a, uh, we already have prepared a number of questions, but please feel free to send any you may have in our chat uh, and we will answer those at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. Steve, let's start with you and then move to our doctors. How are you handling new client patient signups? So uh, the short answer to that is through Zoom meetings and DocuSign. Uh, there's no other way for us to do it. Uh, the kind of cases that I work on, the initial meeting is extremely intimate. You know, we meet two, three times on handling, you know, paralysis, amputations, death of, you know, unfortunate circumstances, loss of a child or husband or something like that. And it's difficult, but, uh, uh, not seeing the person face to face, but we've signed up um, some cases in the last few weeks, and Zoom is the way to go, and DocuSign uh, is, is what we've been doing. Amazing, amazing. And then for Dr. Horfar, let's head over to you. How are you handling new client patient signups? Uh, so at this point in time, all three clinics are open, and we are treating both new patients as well as established patients based on the CDC protocols. What we're doing, there are certain things we're taking into place. For example, sanitizing the tables and the equipments. That's an obvious thing that we were doing even before. But one of the things that we're now uh, starting to do is face masks. And we're wearing them and we're also giving them to patients. So before the new patient comes into our office, once we have them, we basically already prepare their face masks in a Ziploc bag with their name on it. So as soon as they get in, we can give it to them and have them place it on. And at the same time, we're uh, we're utilizing social distancing in the sense that we have no waiting period. So as soon as the patient comes in, we take him directly in. And as Steve mentioned, we're doing the same thing. We're emailing them the forms, having them fill up the forms, and then emailing it back to us, or they print it and bring it back to us. If they're not very savvy as far as computer savvy, we give them the forms, they go in the car, they fill up the forms, and they come back to our office. Wow, okay, great. Uh, Dr. Price, did you want to add to that, um, how you guys are sort of handling new client patient signups? Uh, it's very similar to that. Uh, orthopedics actually lends itself well to the Zoom meetings because if somebody says their shoulder hurts and then they show you they have limited motion and they point to where it hurts, that gives you a lot of information. So we, we're following the same protocols and finding it works very well. Okay. Well, Dr. Price, since we're, you know, we're with you right now, how is it possible to document a patient's injuries due to COVID-19 during this time? Right, well, similar to my previous comment, a lot of it is subjective, of course. It's the okay. patient telling you that their shoulder hurts or another body part. Um, they can tell you what their pain scale is, you know, how much they're hurting between zero and 10. And in a lot of instances, they can show you what their limitations of motion are. So we're documenting 
what we're able to. And then if there's a plan for a further evaluation or treatment, uh, when they do come to the office following the CDC guidelines, then we can add in the objective portion where you actually put hands on and test st stability and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how we're doing it. Great, great. And Dr. Gorfar, um, for you, is it possible? I agree with, yes, I agree with Dr. Price. We're pretty much taking the same um, limits, but with us, 95% of our patients are already coming in for therapy and for treatments. We have that 5% based on their age factor or predisposition, uh, predisposing factors that we don't want them to come to our office at this point. And those are the patients that we do telehealth, which consists of both telemedicine as well as phone, if they don't have access to telemedicine. And Dr. Price is correct. I mean, majority of our information that we gather is from the history as well as just going over their symptoms, figuring out what part of the body is involved, if it's a radiating pain, if it's numbness, tingling, and based on that, we could put an assessment together and put a plan for them as far as home care until they could come to our office and see us personally. Oh, wow. So I have a question for both doctors. We're curious how telemedicine differs between specialties. Could each one of you weigh in on how you're handling it at your own office and perhaps even other specialists within your office? Dr. Price? Uh, yes. Um, and this is a good time to also mention the discussion that takes place over telemedicine. For example, almost everything a chiropractor does actually improves the immune response. Uh, Hands-on, we know that there's some evidence that, you know, hands-on that makes you feel better, improves your immune response. Manipulation that decreases pain, improves your immune response. However, when you come see a surgeon, almost everything we do decreases the immune response. Mm. And this, this existed even before this national disaster. So we, we really like when chiropractors are seeing patients and if they reach a point where they've plateaued in their pain and they're not getting better, better then they come, come see us. Uh, most things we do, like going under anesthesia, having surgery, even cortisone injections, those all can temporarily decrease the immune response. However, chronic pain also decreases the immune response. So by the time the pain becomes chronic, or let's say uh, maybe the chiropractic physiotherapy is working and then maybe reaches a plateau, if that pain's starting to get chronic, then it's okay to move ahead with injections or surgical procedures uh, because it's worth, it's, you're weighing risk. So you're doing a few days of decreasing immune response to get rid of the chronic pain. The, the only exception to that, where we know the type of injection that actually there's evidence that it improves the immune response is PRP injection without anesthesia. So that's why we tend to do a lot of PRP injections as opposed to cortisone shots for joints. Uh, we know that some uh, injections like epidurals and so forth, they require steroids, but we're being very, very careful about how we proceed at this point, consistent with what we just, just discussed. Mm. And for you, Dr. Horfar, um, could you just plan on how you're handling it at your office in terms of telemedicine and your specialty? Yes, telemedicine has certain parameters and we're following all of the California Chiropractic Association and American Chiropractic Association protocols and parameters. Obviously, when we first get the patient on board, we have to get a verbal consent from the patient to start off the procedure as far as getting their history and their consults and getting all of their information. And once we gather the information, we already have pre-made protocols ready to go via email to tell the patients what to do as far as home care is concerned, what stretches to do, applying ice packs or applying heat packs and things of that nature. So if they cannot come to our office for the treatments, this is for the 5% that has not the capability of coming to our office. They'll have something that they could, some ammunition that they could combat their pain and their discomfort. And as far as the PRP injections, I completely agree with Dr. Price. And that's one of the things that we refer out for on a regular basis. And it's been very beneficial. Wow. For you, Dr. Price, um, how is prompt treatment and pain relief possible with COVID-19? Well, I, I think it's, critical that uh, if someone's injured, uh, that they do 
things that improve the immune response as we just discussed. So I think having a chiropractor work with the patient uh, just to make them feel better is probably the best way to initially uh, work with pain. We do know that taking narcotics like opioids or even anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen also decrease the immune response. So I feel like in this environment, um, particularly so, it's important to have someone do hands-on, even if it's manipulation, massage, I, I believe those are the safest ways to proceed in the initial stages of uh, uh, in injury that pops up from some kind of accident. Mm. And for, for you, Dr. Horfar, is it, uh, you know, how, can you sort of elaborate on how prompt treatment and pain relief is possible for you during COVID-19? When you say prompt treatment, I'm assuming also the waiting period that the patient has to wait in order to get at. So one of the things we've done in our clinic is, as opposed to reducing our hours, we actually have expanded our hours so we can spread the patients throughout the day. So we don't have a waiting room anymore. And as soon as the patient comes in, we take them straight to our rooms. All of our clinics have about six or seven plus rooms. We take them straight in, we treat them. And then after they're done with their treatments, they leave the office. We're trying to really keep the patients apart from each other so there's no, so we keep the social distancing into play. Interesting. So Dr. Price, who can still undergo procedures and surgery during this time? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, a lot of people obviously would like to wait, but if somebody has chronic pain, yeah. uh, in other words, it's approaching six months after an injury and the pain is just not satisfactory for them, uh, we know that it's just constantly suppressing the immune response. So at that point in time, we weigh the risks and we say, okay, you know, th these are what the risks are. Um, would you like to proceed? Obviously, we follow all those CDC guidelines just mentioned at our place as well. And if they want to, then we will do the procedure um, for that to help relieve the pain. And then we'll have them isolate themselves after the procedure at home, uh, at least for the first few days and preferably longer, because we know there is a immune response decrease there for the initial few days. Okay, and Dr. Horfar, um, who, who can still undergo procedures and surgery? Uh, I cannot really comment as far as surgery is concerned, but I concur with Dr. Price as far as what Dr. Price just said. He's absolutely right. Perfect. Um, Steve, I want to jump over to you. How do you think insurance companies will react to telemedicine and gaps in treatment due to COVID-19? I mean, so the answer to that question becomes when. For example, when are they gonna react? What's the concern as to when are they gonna to react to a gap in treatment or telemedicine? Is it gonna be in front of a jury? Is it gonna be uh, on the, over the phone when you're trying to negotiate a settlement? And so those things kind of depend. So if it's in front of a jury, I mean, I could see them reacting adversely. I mean, everyone inherently thinks, you know, insurance companies are evil, so they assume the worst. Um, which, you know, I don't know which way you want to go with that, but ultimately they would tell their defense attorney to question a plaintiff on the stand about a gap in treatment. How would that look in front of a, in front of a jury? So the way that I see it, and I've tried a lot of cases, is all the patient has to say is, uh, it was terrible, I was in more pain because of the quarantine, I was able to do telemedicine, I had home therapies and exercises that the doctor gave me, um, I couldn't come in and so on and so forth. You know, I've compromised the immune system. So as soon as they say something like that, then the jury's going to understand that because we're all in that situation. So I don't think it's going to affect plaintiffs at trial. With respect to negotiating settlements, um, we're going to see. I mean, that argument's going to come up here in about four or five months when we start trying to settle cases that have gaps in treatment due to COVID. Um, but I think they're going to be reasonable. I mean, it's a human condition kind of circumstance. So I don't think too adversely, uh, to be honest. I think it should be fine. So Steve, how do you believe then current settlements with insurance companies will be affected? For example, do you believe lien negotiations will be lowballed due to an increased desire to settle? You know, so that's the topic for attorneys. How are insurance companies, because see, here's, 
from the plaintiff's standpoint, what insurance companies try to do, what I've been told uh, as I was a grown up as an attorney is they try to keep plaintiff's attorneys poor. <laughs> That's the point. That's what they try to do. So it's like, you know, settle late, pay late, you know, keep the money from us so that we can't continue and pay our bills. And that's kind of like the premise, right? However, we haven't really seen that. Uh, what we've seen is they don't, adjusters and defense attorneys don't have anything to do. You know, yeah, they could take a, a deposition or do a mediation via Zoom or something like that, but they have a lot of free time. So we, my associates have been on the phone um, settling cases and we find that insurance companies understand that this is a short-term problem uh, we don't know when we're going to get a trial date granted and all these things. So we haven't necessarily been lowballed. Uh, things have been resolving, maybe a little bit of a discount. Uh, we haven't really seen that. It's been business as usual pretty much. Uh, so I, I, that's my experience. I can't speak to others. And the last thing I'll say about it, you know, our big concern, even for a firm like mine, at some point, we're going to run out of cases to settle. We have cases that a colleague of mine told me they're pregnant. I was like, that's a good analogy. They're ready to go and they're, they're, they're about due. And so those are the ones that we went to to settle so we can make money during this crisis. My biggest fear is once carriers realize that we're gonna run out of cases to settle, then we're in, we're in trouble. It just so happens that that period of time for most firms is gonna coincide when the quarantine is lifted next month, hopefully. So hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, so we'll see. Those are kind of some of the dynamics that are going on that, I, that I've experienced in the last few weeks and months or so. Now, for Dr. Horkar, for you, um, how does it work when a patient needs a translator? Again, as far as telemedicine and telehealth, what we need to do is we need to get the patient's consent. We have translators inside of our office that can translate for the patients using you know, following the HIPAA guidelines as far as the guidelines are concerned. Sometimes the patients feel more comfortable if it's a family member. As long as there is a verbal consent from the patient that if you use a translator, then we're good to go. And then for uh, you, Dr. Price, how is Pledge handling that? If uh, yes, we're, we're fortunately, we fortunately have some on-site translators and uh, you know we practice the CDC guidelines, of course, with uh, social distancing with them if they're present. If not, you know we'll just conduct it on a three-way call or a Zoom call, uh, similar to what was just discussed. Amazing. And Dr. Horfar, how are telemedicine appointments being billed? Um, and are they being charged the same? Could you sort of elaborate on that for us? I can't, I mean, telemedicine as, a, telemedicine as a whole can be divided into two parts. Um, you have the face-to-face -face and you also have the telephone depending on which route you're going. Now they've gotten very lax as far as what platform you can use in order to do the face-to-face -face contact with the patient as far as the uh, technology is concerned. So for example, we use FaceTime and a lot of people have it on their iPhone. And that's what we use. There are certain codes that you're supposed to use and there are parameters as far as how often you can use them. For example, you cannot go over seven days from the, from the day that you've done one. And depending on the timing, as far as how much time you've spent with the patient um, on the phone or on the face, FaceTime, that's how you can bill. Um, if you like, you can definitely place my email at the end of this and if anybody needs the codes or if anybody needs the parameters I can go ahead and email it to them so they could go ahead and use it for for their benefit as well. Great Dr. Horper we have a question for you in the chat it says please explain how the Kairos do telemedicine how will they treat? Okay so as far as the assessment one of the first things that we need to do we need to make sure the patients are not abandoned during this time the ones that cannot come into our office so as the doctor, we all, all of us, get on the phone with the patients and we see number one, how they're doing. So we go over the subjectives and we see if there's any changes as far as their subjective findings are concerned, any increase in pain, decrease in pain. And we basically go over what we discussed earlier as far as figuring out what's causing the pain. Based on that, we can give them some home remedies that we basically sent to them. And 
that's the best way that we could treat them at this point for the patients that cannot come into our office. For the other 95% of the patients, we basically have them come into the office and we just follow CDC protocols, as we mentioned before, and have them treat at the office. Dr. Price, what specialists are offered at Pledge? And are they all practicing telemedicine right now? Uh, yes, we're, we're all practicing telemedicine. We have uh, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, podiatry, uh, pain management. Uh, we're more of an interventional uh, treatment group. We also have a neuropsychologist. Uh, well, a couple of them we use for traumatic brain injury referrals at, at the approval of the attorney. Um, and some internal medicine for things like pre-op clearance and so forth. And Dr. Horfar, we have a question uh, in the chat. Is it true that clients will have lower bills, therefore they're lowering their total meds, resulting in a lower offer? Or actually, I believe this might be for you, Steve. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I guess the question says, great points as always, Steve. How will the fees be billed for the docs when it's telemedicine? Well, let's ask. Docs, uh, how are you guys going to bill? What are we going to, what kind of billing are we going to see? Do you, if your deposition's taken later to justify the bill, what kind of answers are you going to have if your billing is any different than what it usually is, uh, you know, in normal times? I, I, I don't know. If you could tell me that, then I can give you an answer. I, I think if, if, if one of the doctors can answer that, uh, how's billing going to be? I could take that. I mean, or Dr. Price, do you want to go? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, yeah. I'll one, after you. All right. Yeah. One of the key things I think for us is going to be documentation. We need to document and document everything as far as what was the reasoning that they did not come to our office and get treatments as far as our office is concerned. The way I look at this is the way I would look at a patient who is, for example, pregnant in the third trimester and they cannot come into our office because of that reason. So we wait for them to have their baby and then we restart their treatment afterwards. It's the same kind of a thing where, yes, there is going to be a gap, but a lot of them are still experiencing a lot of pain during this gap. So as soon as this quarantine is lifted, we're going to have the patients, the, the 5% that are not coming to our office, to return to, the, to our office. We have to do a thorough evaluation on them and see where their pain level is at at that point. If they've had any flare-ups because they were not able to come in for their therapy and start treatments with them again. And that's how we're going to justify the gap. And uh, just in addition to that, I would say that uh, just last week, the state of California issued a statement that basically the billing for telemedicine is to be the same as a normal visit. Uh, they, they applied it to uh, the workers comp field, consistent with Medicare changes that were made, and it's intended to be for the duration of this national emergency. So I think they'll notify us when they're ready to stop doing that. Uh, and if I recall correctly, there is a modifier. I think it's modifier 95 that you tack on if you were going to file with work comp or Medicare or somebody like that. Obviously, in PI, we don't file like that. But the principle of billing the same amount is there. Uh, and it's supported by that statement that came out of the state of California last week. Yeah, so I, I would just chime in by saying then the answer is the same. Uh, as it always has been, if a physician or, you know, any kind of healthcare practitioner can justify their billing, then it'll be taken seriously and it'll be paid. Um, that's the answer. It will be paid if there is a ju good justification for it and it's reasonable and uh, they have, you know, uh, like, like Dr. Price said, if there's something like that to justify it, then there you go. It should be the same. Uh yeah. The liability, you know, the liability is still there. So the, in, in fact, uh, you could also argue that the physician or uh, doctor takes on more liability by doing it by telemedicine. So I don't think the liability really changes at all either. It makes sense. We have a question here that says, are the doctors keeping copies of the web exams? Because I would not like a jury being able to view my client during exam. Dr. Price? We're not keeping copies of any exams. We consider it basically private information. Um, the documents uh, in the notes, so what we write in the note is available in the normal pattern through the patient 
their representative or attorney. And then they can, if anybody wants to see that, they have to obtain that information in a normal way. But we're not publishing any uh, videos. Are you guys recording the exams, Doc? Are you recording them? Um, well, we're not really recording exams because it's really a subjective uh, statement they're making to us anyway. Um, and then if, if I, for instance, if somebody demonstrates to me on a video that they can't, they really can't move their shoulder, then I'll just document, you know, limited range of motion of shoulder. Uh, of course, in the header, I'll say it was a telemedicine visit. So at the very end, I'll indicate uh, when the patient's able to present themselves for physical, physical exam, we'll confirm with exam. That, that's all we're doing. Uh, just to chime in, sorry. Uh, I know a lot of attorneys are gonna be concerned with if the exams are recorded, that's the first thing defense lawyers are gonna ask uh, treaters to see. So as long as it's FaceTime or Zoom and it's as if it's just face-to-face -face except through an iPad and it's not being report recorded and then notes are being made afterwards, just you know, uh, uh, chart notes. If that's what you guys are doing, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, we, we won't even have that issue. Yeah, what we're doing is, you know, we're not documenting a physical exam. What we're saying is, uh, you know, sub the subjective uh, patient uh, presents uh, for telemedicine, demonstrating decreased range of motion of the shoulder and pain complaints of four to six out of 10. And then we just skip the physical exam section uh, at, to be documented later when we do do a face-to-face -face evaluation. Dr. Horfart, we have a question here in the Q&A for you. How exactly is telemedicine working with PT? Do they get anything to help with exercise? They do. So we have basically cookie cutter uh, exercise programs and protocols for the patients, depending on what body parts are injured and what's the extent of the injury. For example, if it's a patient with a disc versus a shoulder tear versus a sprain strain, we already have these into play as far as what exercises we can do. And starting next week, our in-house therapist will also do Zoom sessions as far as therapy sessions. Because a lot of our patients, we've already mailed out to them the elastic bands for exercises with demonstrations. But it still will be great for them to have the capability of doing it with our therapist. And they're going to show it to them pretty much live for them to figure out exactly how to do the exercises in the meantime until they can come into our office. We have another question here. Are you recommending that your clients prepare ongoing daily journals, diaries, ADLs, compromise, physical issues, self-help, et cetera? Either one of uh, the physicians. Dr. Price, we'll go ahead with you. Um, no, I'm, I'm not really asking them to keep journals. Uh, definitely asking them to do home exercises. You know, often I'll just demonstrate using a TheraBand. Um, what kind of exercises they can do at home. And, and the other thing is also what to avoid. So it, it's not too much different than what we would tell them in the office. It's just the demonstration is uh, over video. So I have a question. Um, do you believe that this is the new normal, Steve? For, do you think, you know, with where we are today, how, how do you foresee, I guess, the future? When it I see it returning back to, I see it returning back to what it used to be. I hope, I mean, this is not the new normal. This is extremely unusual. And I, from what I see in society, again, I'm at home, I haven't left. You know, I, I, I take drives once a week for 20 minutes around my neighborhood, but I don't go anywhere. I just come right back home uh, just to get out of the house. And so I've never seen the streets like this, but as I watch TV, uh, it appears as if, uh, you know, we're trying to find a way where we don't, if we're exposed to COVID-19, it won't kill us. There's treatment, you know, we can survive it. And I see people in, in an effort to do that, society seems they're trying to go back to, you know, what, what we were before we started safely. I mean, that's our endeavor, I believe. I mean, that's what I'm doing. I'm hoping I can get back to normal. Uh, for example, tomorrow, uh, there's antibody tests being offered, uh, you know, at certain places, just to see if you've had it in the past, because I got really sick in January and February, and I think I may have had it because I was, I just felt all these symptoms, and so they're offering these free testing. Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, it's not for people that have COVID or getting tested for it, but, you know, we want to educate everybody, uh, should educate themselves, uh, respecting the resources and stuff like that. I waited 
uh, for third, you know, some period of time now when they called me and they said, you can do this. And let's find out, you know, what's available to us in the event we were exposed to it and we do contract it, what the treatments are and try to get back to, you know, back to life. I mean, that's the whole point. So I hear people saying, well, there's going to be no more handshaking, no more hugging, perhaps. I don't see that going on forever. I hope not. I'm guessing, but I, I just don't see it that way. So what do you think, Steve, other incremental changes may be between this normal? Uh, and the real normal, if, if, if the incremental changes, well, I mean exactly that continued distance, continued, uh, you know, minimizing the amount of people that socially gather, uh, precautions such as masks. Uh, I have Purell everywhere, uh, and I'm at home. You know, we get one Amazon package, the whole house freaks out. They're putting, you know, gloves on and this and that, and oh my god, we brought. COVID-19 into our house, you know, this, that. So we developed a protocol as to how we're going to handle that. Everything gets boiled, like, you know, all these different things, you know, the, we do shopping and the bananas have to be hot water. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. However, uh, we have not eased off of that. Uh, we have not been desensitized yet. So the incremental new normal is going to continue to be that even after the government lifts the quarantine, just because we're human beings, we want to be safe and we were worried. And, and so it's going to go on for a little bit of time for sure, you know, but at some point, I hope that we can get enough information, we can get some kind of a vaccine so that we can, we can return to life. Look, I'll say this last thing, I don't want to talk too long on this issue, but every, it seems every decade or so, or every 20 years, 30 years, we have something like this, be it HIV, be it the Spanish flu in the 19 early 1900s or be it whatever it is. And uh, what I see is I've never seen it like this where everyone's quarantined. So on the one hand, I'm so proud of our country and our society for coming together like this and the world, uh, you know, to say so that we are prepared and we, we did this and now we know what it's like so that in the event in the future where it's something that will absolutely kill you for sure if you get it, we know how to respond. So in one way, one could say this was a good opportunity to, to practice this kind of unity, even with all the economic uh, negatives that have come with it. Uh, so uh, I hope that this incremental new normal is not, doesn't last too long. I'm happy to see that we were prepared for it, to handle it in the best way that we could. But I see it, you know, I see it getting back to normal, hopefully, you know, maybe by the end of the year would be great. But I'm going to practice this when I go out, you know, myself, I'm going to be extremely careful, but at some point I'm going to let it go. Absolutely. Gonna... Absolutely. We only have a few more questions left here in the chat. Um, Dr. Price and Dr. Horfer, I just want to shift over to you guys for a second. What are your office hours? Are you there daily? Just give us a little spiel on how you're operating at this time so we can let all of our participants know, et cetera. So Dr. Price, what would you say Pledge's office hours are and are you there every day? How is it working for you? Yes, uh, we're, we're still open our normal hours. Now, now a lot of it is us just coming in and sitting in the room like I am now doing telemedicine visits. Uh, so that's changed, but the, the hours are still the same. Okay. And Dr. Horfar, are your hours still the same? Are you there every day? We've expanded our hours. We're now open from 8 o'clock in the morning all the way till 6 o'clock. And then we attribute, I mean, we contribute the early mornings for the telemedicine. So sometimes we get in as early as seven o'clock and also during lunch times is the best time to catch a lot of the patients. The good thing is everybody's home, so you can catch them at any time. There's no specific time that you need to catch them for the telemedicine. As soon as you call them, they pick up and they're waiting to speak with you. So it's kind of nice. I've never had this before where as soon as you call anybody, they're just there willing to talk and, you know, you know, go over their symptoms and everything else. And they're very patient. So that's, that's always great. Great, great. Um, last question, Steve, in the chat is for you. Where is the free antibody test? Please tell us. Um, I'm going to my doctor's office. Okay. So I would encourage, they have these tests available now. I just found out, well, not just, I just found out that uh, they're scheduling me on uh, NP and other people. Uh, I would contact, contact your physician. So I, I called my general practitioner when all this uh, went down and I asked him, what should I do? He told me, we're going to get an antibody test. It's being used abroad right now. I think Asia has it. Some European countries have it. 
He said, we're gonna get it here in about 30 days. And I asked him, uh, when can I make an appointment? He said, you know, I'll email you. I got, I got an email yesterday and uh, it's available. I'm gonna go in tomorrow. So it is my GP. So I would tell people to contact your general practitioners and see if they have it. Um, I, I'd like to know if I, if, I, if I was exposed to it, and if I in fact did have it. So my general practitioner is where it's available and I've been planning for it now for, for a month. Great. So. Great. Is there anything else either of you, any of you would like to add to this that I didn't ask or that the chat didn't ask? If you guys have any more questions in the chat before we wrap up and thank our panelists today, please drop in your question so I can get it answered for you. Um, what about epidurals? That's just the general question that just came into the chat. So uh, Dr. Price, the question is, what about epidurals? What will happen to those? Okay, so that's a great question that goes back to our previous comments that uh, using epidurals with steroids, so if you put steroid in the epidural, there is a decrease in the immune response. It knocks your immunity down for at least a couple days. It can be up to a couple weeks. So if you're going to do it, uh, you know, don't do it on somebody who just got injured last week. Uh, if, but if the pain is chronic, it, if they fall, if they start approaching that six-month mark, and it's just everyday pain and they're having to take Norco and anti-inflammatories, just discuss with the patient. Listen, the epidural knocks the immunity down a little bit, but your immunity is down every day because you have chronic pain and you're taking these meds. So do you want to proceed? Uh, and then if the decision is to proceed, uh, then it's done you know, with basic sterile technique. And then it's a good idea for the patient to go ahead and consider isolating themselves for at least a few days and technically up to a couple of weeks if they're going to have a procedure just because their immune system is slightly down for that period of time. Great, great. Well, if there isn't anything else that you would like to, oh, Steve, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, for, for the doctors, I, I wanted to know, what do you guys think about getting tested for COVID or this antibody test that you know I've been talking about? Should we do it? Is it, is it necessary? Will it, is it good information for us to have? Let's say, it comes back and I did contract it in January, February. I was like ill for, I couldn't breathe and all these different things. I stayed home for a few days and I, I don't know if it was a milder version. Is this good knowledge to have? Like, should I bother with it? Or what, what, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Because I really don't know. I think from a statistical point of view, it's really important for everybody to get tested because then we'll get a better idea of, first of all, how many people have been exposed to it. And it will also give us an idea as far as the mortality rates and from a statistical point of view, I think it's really important. And I think it's also important for people to know if they've had it so they could move on with their life and start getting back into their life. For example, if you know you have it, I think it'll be less of a stress on you because you could move on. Well, if, if I don't know all the particulars about it, but I hear if it comes back and I, did, I do have the antibodies for it, which means that I had it, I, I assume, am I at risk of contracting it again? And if so, is it going to be less... Uh, you know, is it going to be milder or is it going to, is it going to be worse? Do you guys know like how that's going to be? Uh, we, we don't know the answer to that yet because the, they're still doing studies on the people who are retesting positive after mm -hmm. testing positive and then negative and then positive again. So nobody knows that. However, uh, I, I can tell you, I, I know from uh, the physician offices and uh, doctor's offices, uh, you know, we, we generally practice like everybody has something anyway. Right. I mean, you, right. we wear goggles, masks. So th probably the difference now is that we're all wearing masks as well. So I think it's probably good until we have that information on that reinfection rate, what it is, how bad it is. It's probably a good idea to still practice uh, the same CDC guidelines, even if you are testing antibody positive for now anyway. I was going to also ask you, how much do you guys miss uh, coming to court to testify? <laughs> I actually miss it. <laughs> I, I do as well. I'm just kidding. Yeah. That's a great question. Well, we are going to wrap up here. I want to, if you guys don't have anything additional to add, I want to thank you all so much for joining us this morning or now thank afternoon. You. Thank you, Riley, for having us. Pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have everyone's contact information, so we can send 
any answers to any questions uh, that you may have. And I also want to remind you again that most of our offices at, uh, for Doctors on Lanes are open and we are seeing patients and practicing telemedicine. In addition to our pharmacy, Brightside Specialty Pharmacy, it is open and doing deliveries statewide. So definitely mark that down. We would like to thank Expert MRI, USA Express Legal, and Investigative Services, Pledge Medical, Brightside Specialty Pharmacy for partnering with us today. And our last reminder is that we are doing something called Walkthrough Wednesdays on Instagram, where we will be doing walkthroughs with our doctors and their offices, discussing more about their protocol, et cetera. So please follow us on Instagram. Check us out on live on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. And thank you all once again for joining our first webinar. This was so informative, so great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.